Hi everyone, I am Dr. Andy. It is time for today's Facebook Live. Um, while I'm waiting for all of you to join and to log on, I will give a brief introduction into who I am. Um, so I am a naturopathic physician. I have been practicing in Toronto, Canada for about 15 years now, sorry, 12 years. Um, at this point, I, my practice used to focus more so on sports medicine. I was a personal trainer, I was a dancer, uh, and now I focus more on metabolic nutrition, hormonal balance. Um, I do a lot of hormone replacement therapy in men and in women, um, a lot of fat loss, weight loss. We do, we focus a lot on cognitive decline, uh, reversing, preventing Alzheimer's, and at the foundation of really all of our protocols is that low carb and keto standpoint. Um, so keto is something I personally have been doing for many years, at least 15 years now. It was something I was introducing into my practice as well with my patients. So it was a very significant uh, change and benefit to my practice to be able to introduce exogenous ketones as well uh, for my patients who weren't able to follow a ketogenic diet or those who just really weren't ready. So if somebody comes in with a really unhealthy diet, I'm obviously not going to put them on a keto diet right away. Um, so allowed for a really nice transition. Um, and even for those who were keto, it allowed it to optimize the, the benefits and the health benefits for them. So it has made a really significant change in my practice. Um, in our practice or in our clinic, we all function from that low carb keto standpoint. Uh, one of our primary focuses is all is also longevity and regenerative medicine. Um, so the ketogenic diet and exogenous ketones are really a big part of that. Uh, so it's something that all of our providers really embrace. All of our employees are embracing that now as well. So most of our employees um, and their families have gone keto with us as well. So it's been a really great, um, a really great introduction um, into our practice as well. Uh, and I will apologize. I'm a little bit sick today, so please excuse. I sound a little bit unwell. Uh, thank you. Thankfully, Dr. Heather was able to cover for me last week. Um, but this is always one of my favorite times of the week. So uh, I'm always thrilled to join. So thankfully, I was able to log on today, but I am still a little bit sick. So please just excuse that um, as I go through. I know now that things have opened up a little bit more. We're all catching those colds. I have a daughter in daycare. Uh, so she's bringing lots of things home. So I'm sorry I sound a little bit sick. Um, but happy that I'm able to log on and share. So I am going to get straight to your questions. Okay, so let's get started so I can answer as much as I can in the time that we have today. Um, is it okay to take Signal OS PM in the morning? Always have extras of those. Um, you can. The only thing is that they can help a little bit with sleep, so it might make you tired during the day. Um, so if you have extra and you want to give it a try, give it a try and try and pay attention. See if you're a little bit more fatigued during that day. Um, again, because the formulation does allow, it does help to improve your sleep a little bit. Um, so if you get a little bit tired when you take it in the morning, then I would switch it back to the evening. Um, otherwise, if you feel okay, uh, then you should be fine. Go ahead and take it in the morning. There's no reason uh, and there's nothing in that formulation or in that product um, that should make it that you can't take those in the morning. Um, you can also take those with your ketones as well. So if you're taking your ketones first thing in the morning, you can absolutely take the Signal OS in the morning as well. If you're fasting, it doesn't break your fast. Um, so you can take those in the morning with fasting. Um, and actually on that note, I get a lot of questions about the fasting and whether or not we can take ketones um, in the fasting window. So for those of you who are doing intermittent fasting, um, I do encourage sort of a shorter fast as people sort of build up to doing a reboot. So I do encourage a 16 hour fast as frequently as possible during the week. So from dinner until your first meal the next day. Um, so 16 hours in that window and then in that fasting window in the morning. So you're sleeping through most of it. Um, in that fasting window in the morning, uh, you absolutely can have your ketones in that window. Um, part of the benefits of ketones is so part of the benefit really is for sorry fasting is to help produce ketones to turn on autophagy and we now know that beta hydroxybutyrate can actually help encourage autophagy um, and can optimize what we're trying to do in that fasting window uh, so I do absolutely allow my patients to have ketones in that fasting window um, and that's not a problem and then if you want a second serving and um, that's okay as well Ketones cannot import to Austria. It's not a lot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that and um, that you're not able to do that. I'm sure there are some, uh, if you're ever traveling outside of Austria, hopefully you can get some shipped to you so that you can give it a try. Uh, but I am sorry to hear that you're not able to get that for you. 
Do I suggest women doing the reboot during certain phases of their cycle? So I would say that depends on each woman. Uh, so I know that some people will opt not to do a reboot when they're on their, um, or when they're menstruating. And so it depends really on how you feel. Um, I personally still engage in intermittent fasting and my patients do the same all throughout the month. Um, but some people have changes in appetite. We have changes in blood sugar. Uh, and so some people don't feel as well. And so that's why it's really important to listen to your body. Nobody's body functions in the same way. Some of us feel better than others at certain times of the month. Some, some women, when they're menstruating, they need to take a little bit of a break. They need to um, dial their exercise back a little bit. So you really have to play around with that and see how you feel. Um, so I would play around with a 16-hour fast and with a 24-hour fast and see how you feel during that time of the month. Um, if you feel okay, then experiment with the reboot at that time. Um, and again, it's very individualized. So some women perfectly fine makes no difference at all. Other women prefer not to do that. They don't feel as great. So this is where it becomes a little bit more individualized. You have to test out and see what feels best for you. Can you drink ketones prior to fasting labs? No, definitely. I wouldn't. If you are, um, doing blood work and they've asked you to be fasted, then you need to be fasted. The only thing you can have is water. Um, sometimes if you're on medication, they'll say you can have your medication before your blood work. Uh, but no, if you're doing blood work that needs to be fasted, please don't have um, any ketones, don't have anything in your system, uh, and make sure that you're completely fasted, just water, and then maybe medication, um, so nothing else. So can I talk about menopause and ketones? Um, so lots of questions about the menopause and ketones right now. So um, I'm thinking you're asking about the benefits of ketones during menopause. So the first thing if that's important to remember is that when we're moving into menopause, the primary thing that's happening is we're losing hormones. Um, there is nothing that will bring your hormones back aside from hormone replacement. Um, so we do a lot of hormone replacement. My first suggestion is to talk to a functional medicine doctor in your area um, because getting those hormones back into your system will make a really significant difference. But that said... We do know that in menopause, women naturally become insulin resistant, their cortisol levels go up, um, we gain fat specifically in the middle area, and this is where uh, ketones and beta hydroxybutyrate can absolutely be helpful. Uh, we know that BHB plays a role in, with our cortisol. It brings us from our sympathetic into that parasympathetic state, so helps transition us into sort of that lower stress state. Um, the impact that it has on our blood glucose and on our insulin levels. So there are benefits that we can see as you transition into menopause when we engage in a ketogenic diet or taking exogenous ketones. So speak to your doctor as you transition. Um, you'll probably, if it's safe for you, you'll want hormone replacement in there as well, but they're really great things to work together um, that can show some great benefit. <clears throat> what should you do if you've hit a weight loss plateau? So if you've hit a weight loss plateau, um, my favorite thing is fasting. That's really the greatest thing. That's one of the best things I like people to try is intermittent fasting. Um, so 16 hours every day or about five days a week if you can, from dinner till your first meal, 24 hours once a week, and then a reboot once a month if you're able to do that. The reboot's a really great way uh, to get past a plateau if you're already um, if your body's already used to fasting, then the reboot's a really good thing to um, to look into to help you get past your plateau. And then you have to start looking at the other underlying factors that would be impeding weight loss. Things like inflammation, microbiome dysfunction, loss of hormones. Even if you're not in menopause or perimenopause, doesn't mean that you might have a hormone dysfunction that could be contributing to that. Um, so it's really important to get all of your hormones checked, get your thyroid checked. You need to look at your stress levels. Are you spiking cortisol? Are you insulin resistant? All of those things play a really, really big role in our inability to lose weight. And so those are things that need to be balanced internally in order to see those fat loss goals that you're looking for. Um, so it's really important that you look into some of the other those, look into some of those other things, talk to your doctor, get your blood work done, get really comprehensive labs done, um, and just make sure that you've addressed everything that you need to. And that takes a little bit longer. So if you've hit a plateau because you have microbiome dysfunction or you have systemic inflammation or insulin resistance, that's going to take longer for you to see weight loss because that's going to take longer to fix with your functional med doctor. Um, so you might be looking at three to six months before you start seeing those numbers change because there are things that are happening internally that really need to be rebalanced before you see that weight loss. So it's important that you get some of those things checked as well. 
Um, I do often encourage also, if you hit a plateau, start tracking your food. Um, I don't generally encourage my patients to track food. Nobody wants to do that. I know that it's tedious. Um, but again, if you are noticing you've hit a plateau, you need to start tracking your food, even just for seven days to get a better sense of what you're eating, how much you're eating and see if there's sort of any tweaks that you need to make or any, any areas that we can make some changes. I tried the seven day challenge, but noticed after the third day I was feeling bloated um, and then you had to stop. So yes, that's often normal. Anytime we make um, any significant you know, dietary lifestyle supplement changes, our body can respond in different ways. Um, so it might be for you just need to try a little bit uh, more slowly. Maybe you need to reduce how much you're taking or take a look into other things, especially when you're starting to feel bloated. Uh, take a look at your microbiome. Are there foods that you're eating that you're not supposed to eat? So there's some other things that you should look in there as well. Um, but you might want to start just by reducing how much you're taking as a start. See if that makes a difference for you and then go from there. Uh, can these help with ADHD? So there's some interesting research looking at the role of beta-hydroxybutyrate in ADHD. Um, for ADHD in kids, I refer a lot to the Charlie Foundation. They've got lots of research on keto and children, um, lots of research on ADHD, on epilepsy, obviously, as well. Uh, but what they're finding is that children with ADHD have similar brain waves to children with epilepsy. So when they sort of take the brain waves in a child, they see the brain waves are quite similar, and they suspect that that's why beta-hydroxybutyrate shows benefit in children with ADHD. We know that the ketogenic diet was created to help manage seizures in children with epilepsy. Um, and so they're seeing that the brain waves are similar. Uh, and so that might be why we're seeing benefit with BHB and ADHD as well. What do you consider comprehensive blood work? Um, I actually put a post up on this, but lots of questions of what is comprehensive blood work. There are a lot of markers you should get checked. You need more comprehensive thyroid plan panel, not just a T T TSH. There are five different thyroid markers. Um, so I do have a post on that, so I would probably go and take a look at that just to see what all those markers are instead of listing all of them off. Uh, but definitely hormones, definitely your full thyroid panel, liver enzymes, inflammatory markers, and then you probably want to do some private testing looking at gut microbiome and things like that. So lots of different testing that you can consider. Um, if you find a functional medicine doctor, they'll be able to sort of steer you uh, in the right direction um, and probably get a lot of that testing. So I'm intermittent fasting. I eat between 1 and 8 p.m. I'm finding I need more protein. If I drink the Keto Pro before bed, will that interrupt my fast? So I'm okay if you drink the Keto Pro before bed. Um, generally, I like to use the Keto Pro to end a fast. Um, I, is there, I don't know. Is there any reason you... I'm curious why you're not getting enough protein. Are you making sure you have protein in all the meals that you're consuming? I would check to make sure you're calculating your protein intake accurately because often we overestimate how much protein we actually need. Um, ketogenic diet isn't actually a really high protein diet. Um, so even if you're intermittent fasting, you should be able to get all the protein you need in that, um, in that eating window between one and eight. You should be able to get all of it. So I'd probably track your food a little bit uh, and see if you could, if there are any tweaks you can make there or even maybe just add sort of the Keto S Pro or the Keto Pro sort of in the middle of your day to get some of the protein in as well. But you should be able to get it in from a food standpoint, unless you're vegetarian or vegan. Uh, but you should be able to get it in di from, uh, from dietary sources. So I'm just curious about your calculation um, about how much protein you should be getting in. So I track your food a little bit just to ensure uh, that you are or aren't getting enough and then see if you can maybe add some because if you're getting protein every meal, you should be able to get what you need throughout the day. Uh, if you have diverticulitis and you did not find out until doing keto, what diet um, should you move to to continue losing weight and can you still drink keto nat? Um, so you can still follow a ketogenic diet if you have diverticulitis. You can still take your exogenous ketones. Obviously work with your specialist. Make sure that they say that's okay with you. Um, but there's no reason you shouldn't be able to follow a keto diet. Obviously there's specific foods with diverticulitis that they'll ask you to avoid. Um, so ask your specialist what they want you to avoid. Uh, but there's no reason that you, you can't follow a ketogenic diet uh, just because you have diverticulitis. So that shouldn't really impede that in any way for you. Ketones help my daughter focus. She has autism and it calms her nerves. That's great. Um, I, love hearing, I love hearing stories like that. So I think that that's wonderful. 
Well, ketones help with weight loss. So I touched a little bit on weight loss earlier and some of the things that might um, impact if you're experiencing weight loss plateau. I do always like to emphasize that ketones are, are that keto OS or ketonat, it's not a weight loss supplement. Um, you experience fat loss as a secondary benefit as due to what the beta hydroxybutyrate is doing in your system. Um, so the impact that it has on leptin and ghrelin or hunger and our satiety hormones, um, the impact that it might have on blood sugar or on our insulin. And so we see that fat loss as that secondary benefit um, and also can help the body to burn some of that fat for fuel as well. Um, so we can see weight loss, but as I say that, I want everyone to understand that that will be different in everyone. So a lot of people will say, well, my friend took this and they lost 20 pounds in the first month. And that is not the experience that everyone is going to have. We're all coming from a different metabolic state. We all have different underlying health conditions, different things that our bodies need to regulate, adapt, and adjust. Um, so just know that if you saw that story where somebody lost, you know, I lost 20 pounds, 60 pounds, uh, and you're not, then just understand that that's okay. Um, everybody is different. There might be other things that you need to address so not to be discouraged by that. And just dig a little deeper and see what it is that you might personally need to be addressing in order to reach the goals that you're looking for. Is the product good if you already follow a ketogenic diet? Will it be too much ketones because my body is already in keto mode? So no, you won't have too many ketones in your system. Um, Ketones are water soluble, so if our body doesn't make use of what's in our system, they will be just released through our body, mostly through urine. Um, so if we have more than we need, it goes out in the urine. Um, it is good if you're already following a ketogenic diet. There's a cumulative effect there. So some people get concerned if they're following a ketogenic diet and they take ketones, will their body stop making ketones? No, that's not what we're finding. We're finding it's a cumulative effect. Um, so we'll optimize what you're experiencing when you're taking the ketones. So you can absolutely do that. Um, you won't overdose or overdo it with your ketones. And if you have more than your body needs, your body will just eliminate it because it's water soluble. Very difficult um, to accumulate too many ketones. You often hear people talk about um, diabetic ketoacidosis, but that can only happen in somebody who doesn't have insulin. Um, so I saw a question earlier about type 1 diabetics. That's the only person, that's the only instance where somebody would need to be a little bit concerned is a type 1 diabetic. So if you're not a controlled diabetic, that's where I would say it's probably not the best thing to start. If you do have type 1 or even late stage type 2 diabetes where you're taking insulin, you have to work with your specialist. Um, I know a lot of endocrinologists are not necessarily... Um, well versed in the ketogenic diet, but I'm sure you can find someone who can help you navigate through that. Um, because again, you need to be a controlled diabetic, type one or type two, before I would have somebody engage in the ketogenic diet. But as long as you have insulin in your system, um, you will not go into keto to um, ketoacidosis. Uh, and if you are diabetic, I would measure your blood ketone levels as frequently as you measure your blood glucose levels. I've been told that being on a keto diet long term is not good for your body. Is that true? No, there's no reason you can't be keto long term. There are no detrimental health impacts. There's no, there's no reason why somebody should, should stop being keto. Um, you, I hear a lot of that when you Google, you'll hear people say it's bad for you. There's no evidence to really support that. So I'm not really sure why they're making those statements. It's not true. I do find that the only challenge is staying keto long term is difficult just from a compliance standpoint. So somebody being 100% keto all the time is very challenging to follow. Um, I generally move into what I call sustainable keto and I move my patients into sustainable keto, which is where we're essentially cyclic keto, you're cycling it. So we're following a ketogenic diet and then maybe once or twice a week, you're eating sort of what you want. And then you go back to keto. So you're going in and out of ketosis as sort of as you like. Um, I usually introduce that sort of down the road once somebody is in ketosis already. So if you're looking to get into nutritional ketosis, we have to wait until you're there. Once you're there, and that can take longer for different people. It might take a month. It might take six months. Once you're there, then we can start playing around with cycling. And the longer you're keto, the easier it is to cycle back into ketosis. So eventually I do have people do that again it's more sustainable but there is no reason that somebody can't be keto long term <clears throat> what would be good for 
what would be good for iron being low? Um, sorry, I'm not, if you could just repost that question, the question about iron being low. I don't know if you're asking about iron supplementation, but if you could just clarify that, that would be great. And then I'm happy to answer that for you. Uh, ketones and thyroid. So there is a misconception about ketones being detrimental to thyroid function, and that's not the case. Um, a lot of people will say, well, the, the thyroid needs carbohydrates to function. It's not actually true. It's actually the reverse. Carbohydrates need thyroid hormone to break them down. So when you eat a carbohydrate, the body will release more thyroid hormone to metabolize the carbohydrates. But you don't need carbs for optimal thyroid function. And following ketogenic diet is not harmful to your thyroid function either. The only time I see that that's harmful to thyroid function um, is if somebody is following ketogenic diet incorrectly, they're not getting the healthy fats in, so they're doing more um, like protein and veggies, but they're, they're forgetting about the good healthy fats that you need because we need fats to make hormones. So when somebody follows a ketogenic diet that way, that's more where we're likely to see um, some imbalance of different hormones. Um, but otherwise, not a problem for your thyroid. Um, I put a lot of my Hashimoto's patients on a ketogenic diet. It's a very anti-inflammatory because uh, we don't want to introduce inflammatory foods. So I put a lot of my um, Hashimoto's patients on keto. That's sort of the foundation in addition to other treatments. <clears throat> I have high blood pressure. You're drinking two nuts a day. Your blood pressure seems to be going up. Um, so generally, the keto nat shouldn't increase blood pressure. Um, the idea that salt increases blood pressure, so that research isn't quite as sound as we once thought it was. So there's often a concern about sodium and blood pressure. The only concern is if you actually have a sodium sensitivity. So some people are genetically predisposed to sodium causing higher blood pressure. Um, so those people are the only people who'd really need to be concerned. Otherwise, it's not as much of an issue. Um, so if you have high blood pressure and you knew that before you started drinking the keto nat, I would try and see if there were other issues contributing as well. So you have to work with your healthcare provider. Um, cause if you ha if you, your natural or normal lifestyle, you were already having high blood pressure uh, and you haven't made any changes to that. And then you add new supplements in, we're always inclined to say, well, I added this new thing in, it must be causing A, B or C, but oftentimes it was the things we were doing before as well. So you're going to have to do a bit of a an investigation and find out what it is in your lifestyle or your diet that is causing that increase. Um, stress will also drastically increase our blood pressure as well, says so something else that's very important. Um, but I would monitor, I mean, your, your healthcare provider can decide if you need to do a 24 hour BP or something like that. Uh, to get a really good reading of your blood pressure, you can self monitor at home. So a lot of different things that need, I think you need to look into first. Um, and also looking into if the ketones are doing it as well and make sure you really figure out what is causing that blood pressure to go up and then whatever it is, you'll have to, you'll have to eliminate it. Um, does cholestyramine for cholesterol interfere with ketosis? No, not at all. Cholestyramine doesn't interfere with ketosis at all. Um, cholestyramine, um, it's unusual to be on cholestyramine for cholesterol these days, uh, but we have a lot of patients on cholestyramine. It's... In our clinic, though, we're using it for um, people with mold toxicity because cholestyramine is a binder. Uh, so the only thing I would say is if you are on cholestyramine, you just need to take it away from all other supplements, foods, and medications um, because it will bind toxins, but also nutrients. So if you are taking it for cholesterol, you need to just take it away from everything because if you take it with your ketones, it's just going to bind all of it and eliminate. Um, so just make sure you're taking your cholestyramine away from everything else. Uh, but no, nope, doesn't interfere with ketosis. You should be okay. There is some sugar in cholestyramine. Um, it comes two different ways with normal sugar and then with aspartame. Uh, so we always put our patients on the one with the normal sugar, not the one with aspartame in it, because uh, I'd rather patients get the normal sugar than the aspartame. Um, but ketosis is not a zero carb diet. It's just a low carb diet. So the two to five grams of sugar you'll get in your sachet of cholestyramine really shouldn't make that much of a difference. Just factor it in if you are following a ketogenic diet. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, you've been using ketones since October. You're down 51 pounds. That's fantastic. Um, so I think that that's great. So congratulations on 51 pounds. I think you're saying your weight loss is slowing down. That is normal, just to be aware. So the average and sort of sustainable weight loss is one to two pounds per week, usually closer to one pound per week. So that's four pounds a month. 
Um, so it's important to keep that in mind if the goal is fat loss. It's not supposed to come off at 20 pounds a month. So, you know, four pounds a month is really, really good. Uh, and then the more, the more you lose, the more that weight loss will slow down. The closer you come to your actual goal weight, the slower you're going to start to lose it. So if you have more to lose, you'll lose it faster. And then as you slowly get closer to your goal, you'll start to lose it a little bit more slowly. Um, so I wouldn't be discouraged. The 51 pounds is fantastic. Um, so I think you said you're losing about five pounds each six weeks. Again, I think that that's fine. Um, your weight loss will slow down the more weight that you have to, or the more weight that you've lost. Um, so I think it's wonderful that you've lost that much. Don't be discouraged. Just know that you do eventually hit sort of a curve. It won't keep coming off at that, um, at that same rate. I feel alive and energetic and confident. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm still working on my body, but I love my body. Thank you, Charlotte, for sharing that. I love that. I love those stories. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, what can you do for having low iron? So if you have low iron, supplementation is really the only thing that you can do. You've got to take an iron supplement. Um, and then you can, should probably look into why you have low iron. If you're, taking low, if you're taking iron supplements and your iron is still low, you have to look into why. Usually it's a malabsorption issue. Is there celiac? Is there some other... Uh, is there leaky gut, parasites, what else is happening in the gut while you're not absorbing iron um, from supplements or food? So those are things that you have to continue as well. But if it's low, uh, we can't replenish a nutrient deficiency through food anymore. Um, our food just doesn't have the same nutrient level that it used to in the past. Um, so if you do have a nutrient deficiency, deficiency, you have to supplement to get it back up into normal range. And then you can use food to try and uh, maintain and sustain. Uh, my doctor said I should not be in ketosis. I have high blood pressure and fatty liver. Uh, I'd maybe get a second opinion with fatty liver, high blood pressure. There's nothing wrong with being ketosis. Uh, so I'd maybe get a second opinion. <clears throat> um, the one thing that you need to do if you have fatty liver is cut out the carbs. The misconception is that fatty liver is caused by fats. It's not. It's caused by carbohydrates um, or alcohol. Uh, so if it's, if it's non-alcoholic fatty liver, uh, then you need to cut out the carbohydrates. So ketogenic diet is actually one of the best things that you need to do for a fatty liver. Um, so you might want to have another conversation with your doctor um, or find another doctor who can help support you. I obviously can't tell you to do something that goes against what your doctor has said because they know your medical history. Um, but I would find another provider who can work with you, find somebody else who might uh, be able to guide you a little bit more, but there's no reason with fatty liver uh, that you shouldn't be able to be on a ketogenic diet unless there's something else in your health history why that, that why your provider is suggesting you shouldn't do that. Um, again, I don't know your medical history, so you do have to speak to your personal um, provider and find out what is right for you. So that is all of our time today, everyone. Our time always flies by on Wednesday, but thank you so much for joining. Hopefully I answered most of your questions. As always, I will go through um, and answer some questions if I missed any, but enjoy the rest of your week and stay healthy, everyone.